In this roundup of the week, the UK Titans and Belgium relaxes their lockdowns, even though their COVID-19 figures are exactly the same. America descends further into turmoil and China surprises the world by announcing it will commit to net zero carbon by 2060. My name is Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the barely functional track and trace app that is 2020. I hope you're doing well. This week, the UK Prime Minister, the leader of one of the European countries hit hardest by COVID-19, announced a tightening of lockdown restrictions because of the growing number of cases. At the same time, the Belgian Prime Minister, the leader of the European country, hit the absolute hardest by COVID-19, announced a relaxing of lockdown restrictions in spite of the growing numbers of cases. It's as clear an indicator as you can get that different people can look at the same circumstances and decide to do different things. And that's worth noting because just about everybody taking part in the policy discussion right now is 100% certain that their way is the only way. And 100% certain that if you disagree, you're a lunatic. Now, same old, same old, I hear you say. Well, let's take a look first at the UK. First, we were softened up by a presentation of two of the leading UK scientific advisors on COVID-19. And very grim it was too. We were presented with this graph and told that unless we took action, that exponential growth line was pretty much where we might be headed. The interesting thing about this is that this is exactly the sort of presentation that in March, when the whole thing was kicking off, journalists listened to uncritically reported without comment and simply believed it 100%. Well, things have changed. Because while some outlets reported the presentation uncritically, there was quite a lot of kickback. And the validity of that graph was one particular point of focus. The graph implies that if the current growth rate of COVID-19 in the UK continues, then we'll reach 49,000 cases per day by mid-October. Now, that really would be a second wave rather than the shadow boxing we've had to date. But people quickly pointed out that there were two presumptions behind this scenario that were frankly not supported by the evidence that's currently available. One is that COVID-19 is currently doubling every seven days and two, that such a growth rate will continue. Doubling every seven days works out at around 10.5% daily growth, but the current figures estimate growth at between 4 and 8%. And that makes a difference because when it comes to exponential growth, the difference between, say, 7 and 10 days is huge. Here's a version with doubling every 10 days in yellow and doubling every 7 days red. It would still be a major increase, 20,000 cases a day by mid-October, but still less than half the level. Reportedly, the government's higher estimate came from smaller studies involving a few hundred cases and were prompted by fears that some of the failings in the nationwide testing program means that the spread is being underestimated by the official figures, which is possible. And, you know, remember, they were badly caught out at the start of the pandemic when they had underestimated how large an initial seeding of cases was taking place from people coming in from Spain until it was too late. But then there's a presumption that growth rates would stay at the same over the course of the whole month. That's not how the first wave played out. And since we're reckoned to be a couple of weeks behind France and Spain, it's worth noting that's not how things are playing out in those countries either. If the UK's COVID-19 growth followed France and Spain, we'd end up at around 10,000 cases a day by mid-October, not 45,000. A review of the case rate in Spain by the Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine showed that Spain had hit true exponential growth in cases for a period of around two weeks, between the 3rd and the 17th of July. After that point, the rate of growth began gradually to decline. But when the UK Prime Minister made his televised address this week, he kept to the line that the lessons of France and Spain justify stringent action. And more than that, he blamed the spread of a virus on people breaking the rules. Not a natural consequence of relaxing lockdown. Nope, the result of bad people. 
Now, he didn't actually call them bad people, of course. He said that it was because we live in a great and freedom-loving country, which, you know, sounds like something you should celebrate. Instead, it means these new restrictions will be enforced with heavier fines and the military will be drafted in, if necessary, to support the police in enforcement. That didn't go down tremendously well amongst people in his own party, who, you know, are old enough to remember they're supposed to be the Conservative Party, that doesn't believe in interfering with people's freedoms, or at least it didn't used to. You can expect to see some serious kickback on that next week, as the rebellion in the ranks that's been growing now seems large enough to overcome the government's majority in the House of Parliament. However, the truth is that such kickback does not currently reflect the views of the population. According to a snap poll after the Prime Minister's announcement, the measures he announced has majority support. Mandatory face coverings for everyone in taxis and for all retail and hospitality workers, that had public support of 73%. Telling everyone to go home just weeks after having encouraged them to go back to the office, that had the support of 72%. The least popular was the reduction in the number of guests at weddings from 30 to 15. But even that had more support than opposition by a ratio of 4 to 1. A significant percentage of the population is getting fed up of restrictions, but by all evidence the majority remains scared and therefore supportive of more stringent measures, not less. Meanwhile in Belgium, which was burned even more heavily than the UK by the initial phase of Covid-19, and has therefore every reason not to want to find itself back in that situation, it's doing a very different thing. Belgium tried a tightening, with local curfews, mandatory face masks, and a rule of five, even more stringent than the UK's rule of six. And those measures failed to halt the growth in infections. So the thinking is that since this seems to be going on for the long term, Belgium is reducing its restrictions to a level that will still keep some dampener on the spread, but will be at a level that Belgians will continue to support and at least tolerate for the next six months if need be. So while there'll be localised actions in places where infections are high, the rule of five will no longer apply generally, although there's a cap of family gatherings of 10 adults, the obligation to wear face masks is being scrapped, although they still have to be worn in shops and cinemas and public transport. Quarantine periods have been reduced from two weeks to seven days, and so on and so on. Sophie Wilmers, the Prime Minister, said this. It is a long-term vision that must ensure that we do not have to adjust too often and too hard. Certain rules will therefore be relaxed because they are not useful or are untenable. Other measures will be maintained because the epidemic is not over yet. It might be that the relaxation was influenced by the recent Belgian doctor's open letter that had been widely publicised. It's a long letter and goes into a lot of detail. There's a link to the full thing in the video description. The intro says this. We call on politicians to be independently and critically informed in the decision-making process and in the compulsory implementation of corona measures. We ask for an open debate where all experts are represented without any form of censorship. After the initial panic surrounding COVID-19, the objective facts now show a completely different picture. There is no medical justification for any emergency policy anymore. And they go on to say that a cure should not be worse than the disease, which we've heard a number of times. And that's fine if everyone agrees that's the case. And of course, not everyone agrees. So, for instance, Professor Mark Van Ranst, a virologist, said this isn't the time for relaxations. And you should expect this because specialists in their field will always tend to see the issue as a one variable problem with their area of expertise, the location of the variable. Good leadership is guided by the science, not a slave to it, because there's always more than one variable you have to care about. And people are right to point at the inconsistency and in mission creep that is afflicting most of the European countries on this. Remember, the first lockdowns were supposed to flatten the curve and the curve was hospitalisations because the fear was that the health services would be overwhelmed. Sometime between now and then, it stopped being about hospitalisations and became cases. Even in Spain, where unlike most European countries, there has been some small increase in deaths with their wave of cases, they are nowhere near overwhelming their health systems. 
So we moved from a situation where we were prepared to do truly dreadful damage to our society in order to avoid medical chaos and deaths, to now where we seem to think more dreadful damage is justified in the absence of any such chaos but as a result of a lot of positive test results. You may recall that a couple of weeks ago I shared a graph suggesting that those countries that had seen the highest death toll from COVID-19 were largely those that had had a very mild flu season the year before, leaving a higher number of vulnerable people who would in a harder year have sadly died already. Whereas those countries that have seen lower levels of COVID deaths often had a normal or a harsh flu season the year before. That argument seems to have been persuasive to Sweden's chief epidemiologist, Anders Tegnell, who talks about the phenomenon in an interview with a Swedish newspaper. When many people die of the flu in the winter, fewer die in heatwaves the following summer. In this case, it was COVID-19 that caused many to die. That said, Tegnell disappointed many of the die-hard sceptics this week by floating that he might be considering localised lockdown measures in response to a rise in cases in Sweden. He said he might recommend school closures, limits to the size of gatherings and the like, as long as they're only imposed locally and for three weeks at a time. And although the agency has so far been sceptical of rules about face masks, Dr Tegnell now says that it sees a role for them in helping to control local outbreaks. And I said that Tegnell disappointed some of the die-hearted sceptics, and that rather highlights a key point in all of this. The only thing anybody should be doing in this situation is watching the data and the trends very carefully, with a full preparedness to alter their view of what should happen at any time when the data changes. In past weeks, I've shown evidence that the reported uptick in cases in Europe was not accompanied by any increase in deaths whatsoever, long after the two-week lag that we saw in the first wave. And each time, it's always been about, this is the situation now, this is how it appears now. But we're always watching, always looking for the cue that says some decisive action does need to be taken. Now we have Spain where there's some increase in deaths and we've seen some increase in hospitalisations elsewhere. Does that mean it's time to abandon all caution and embrace for new lockdowns? Well, it's a judgment call for every government and it's a difficult call. I can say if I were in government, I would be holding off because the case fatality rate is significantly reduced and the cost to people's lives and livelihoods of lockdown measures are so predictable and extreme. But you should be watching like a hawk. Because in the Northern Hemisphere, we are coming into autumn. It's every chance that the virus becomes more dangerous on a seasonal timescale. Every chance. All those people on both sides who claim total certainty that they know this is no big deal, or they know that this is the deadliest thing ever. Pay attention, those people have been saying this same thing since the very earliest days. No new data will ever move them from their conviction. Right now, the impact of the current infections is highly uncertain. The damage from lockdowns is guaranteed. People who don't get cancer treatment, people whose mental health suffers, um, people who miss out on life chances, people who commit suicide, who are left in care homes without contact with their family, you know, lost and lonely. Those are real costs and they are caused by government action. You don't want to be taking it if you don't need to. Now, if I was actually in government, would I really hold the line on that? I mean, I hope so, but I recognise the enormous pressure that's on every leader in this situation. If you do what I think you should be doing right now, Piers Morgan will tell his audience of millions that you are literally killing people. And forever after, a significant number, maybe a minority, but a significant minority, would take it as an indisputable fact that you callously, deliberately allowed people to die. The lives you save will be invisible. Nobody reports those numbers because we can't count them. But the ones that die... Those are in the headlines. That is a tough, lonely position to be in. Of course, one thing you should be asking yourself if you're paying attention to the data is, how good is the data? Early next week, I'll have a video looking in more detail at the question of are the COVID-19 tests accurate? Because it's an important question that's very much been in the public arena of debate over the last week or two. And it's still a point of debate in the US as well, 
but less so for two reasons. One, because thankfully in the northern states there's no equivalent to Europe's second wave at the moment and cases and deaths are declining now in the southern states. And two, because they've kind of had lots of other stuff to go crazy about. The two big ones this week have been the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the shock of realisation on the part of the Democrats that they've lost their fondest hope that she would hold on until the election before vacating her seat on the Supreme Court. Republicans are rushing ahead to appoint a replacement before the election. Democrats desperate to stop them, but of course really they can't. And I have not much to say about that right now. I mean, there's one principle at work, in spite of all the rhetoric and the arguments and the justifications on both sides, and that's power. Pure and simple. If you can force the result, you do it. And if the other side can stop you, they will do that. End of story. For a life appointment to a body of nine, all the niceties go out of the window. Both sides will do the exact same thing if they get their chance. You may decide it's all down to one side being nefarious because they said this or they said that. Really, the cause of it is it's an ill-defined system. When neither side has an immediate stake, they need to sit down and define precisely how it works in the future. And they should be able to do it because in the long run, it plays out to neither side's advantage. But having a clear rule would avoid the chaos. Personally, I think the system would be better if the judiciary branch wasn't politicised at all in the way that it is. But it is what it is. Now, the other thing that took the attention this week was the announcement that none of the police officers involved in the Breonna Taylor shooting are going to be charged. Now, I pointed out in relation also to the George Floyd case and the Kyle Rittenhouse case that the way that charges are framed are likely not going to come back with the outcome that the BLM crowds demand. And we saw in this case a preview of what that looks like, with two police officers shot in protest in Louisville. Now, fortunately, both officers survived. But this is what happens when the mob decides that justice should follow ideological lines rather than due process. Sadly, it will not be a surprise when this happens again and again as these cases start to come to trial. But we did see some surprises this week. China surprised the world by announcing its commitment to go net zero carbon by 2060. This was announced to the United Nations by Chinese leader Xi Jinping shortly after US President Donald Trump had used his speech to attack China on COVID-19 and on the environment. In addition, Trump put forward a determined argument as to why he was America first and why others should do the same for their countries and that by being clear and self-interested, you'd actually create an environment for more and not less peace worldwide. The interesting thing is that with China signing up to net zero, it is making a significant play to change the global dynamic. China is the world's largest polluter and its carbon emissions have been growing strongly over the last few decades. What Xi Jinping committed to was peaking climate emissions before 2030 and bringing them to net zero by 2060. With the European Union and the UK committed to net zero by 2050, that suddenly changes the landscape enormously. Before the US pulled out of the Paris Agreement and some thought that others might follow him and possibly bring it all down. Now, in one fell swoop, China has ensured that what instead happens is that it looks like America is wholly isolated. I've said before, whether you think climate change is a thing or not, at some point you see which way the world has decided to go and you have to decide whether you're going to try and thrive and survive in that new reality or if you're going to cling instead to old certainties, like so many in history held on against major changes to the bitter end. You might legitimately ask why China decided to announce his commitment at this particular session of the UN, rather than waiting until the big climate change conference next year, COP26. Maybe they think it will influence the US election? China's widely held to want a Biden presidency in preference to a Trump one for 2021. Personally, I doubt that's the reason. I think they know it won't make that much difference to US electors. And for such a major shift it's more likely that it's all to do with its own priorities. On the one hand, China tends to move forwards via the vehicle of five-year plans, and it's in the advanced stages of working on its 14th five-year plan. 
and having perhaps planned to announce its move at COP26 when it was going to be held this year, it couldn't adjust its own timetable to delay an announcement. And we'd already seen some clues that the Chinese government was signalling a change in direction in the building of new coal plants. And now we know why. But the other thing, and very much that bigger picture I mentioned, is that China sees the current America First positioning as its opportunity to increasingly assume a world leadership position. It's the predominant growing power, and many have already shown deference to it on account of their own economic self-interest. Now, we have also seen some pushback as well, of course, as people have kind of suddenly noticed how vulnerable they were becoming. Maybe because of that pushback, China is holding itself up as an internationalist constructive force in contrast to American isolationism on vaccines, on climate change, on globalism. This is how Xi Jinping put it in his speech. Burying one's head in the sand like an ostrich in the face of economic globalisation or trying to fight it with Don Quixote's lance goes against the trend of history. Let this be clear. The world will never return to isolation and no one can sever the ties between countries. And then in another bid for leadership, he called for the reform of the 75 year old system of the United Nations itself and did so again in a manner designed to make a clear contrast. Major countries should act like major countries. They should provide more global public goods, take up their due responsibilities and live up to people's expectations. Some might say China's rather late to the party to be lecturing others on such matters, but of course their hand has to some degree been forced by the pandemic. It may well be that they judge the time would never be better to begin making moves to fill the perceived vacuum left by the US. After all, if Trump loses the election and Biden takes over, they have already inserted themselves and the US can't simply drift back into its former role. If Trump wins, then of course they can simply keep drawing the comparison. Because we do know that most of the target audience in the EU and many other places are very much of the globalist mindset that they're aiming to appeal to. Now of course there is those pesky human rights issues and the removal of freedoms in Hong Kong and the issue of the Uyghur Muslims and all of those, but they know that such concerns are rarely allowed to dominate when national self-interest is in play. But then it could also have been a purely defensive move. The EU had already called on China to make precisely this announcement, saying that it would ultimately be putting tariffs on imports from countries that refuse to get serious about carbon emissions. As many of the countries whose business makes China's factories run sign up to this net zero carbon commitment, they will be looking for supply chains that can meet their needs without producing carbon. And they'll also be in the market for leading edge technology to generate carbon free energy. It's clear from statements they've made to date that China aims to provide both of those, pushing ahead with fourth generation nuclear, for instance, as well as renewable technologies. It is starting from behind because it's been expanding coal and many other things in recent decades. And it is, after all, the world's biggest polluter, not just in terms of carbon. This is now the signal but it's shifting direction. Interestingly, California also this week decided to announce it would ban gasoline cars from 2035 with heavy vehicles following in 2045. And no doubt in the political hothouse that is the US, that comes over as yet more wacky liberal extremism. Although in doing so, it's really only matching commitments by the UK and many EU countries whose deadline is between 2030 and 2040. If the rest of the world begins moving aggressively in one direction, you end up asking yourself how much it remains to America's advantage to refuse to acknowledge that reality. Well, maybe we're going to find out. Watch this space. Time for a couple of quick things I like and don't like. The thing that I like is that, so far, Spotify is refusing to cave in to demands from some of its young, woke employees that it starts censoring the Joe Rogan podcast. For those that live in a cave most of the time, Rogan runs the most successful podcast of its kind worldwide and is known for the very wide-ranging guest list, including the sort of people who, you know, get banned from social media platforms. He signed an exclusive deal with Spotify and moved his podcast over, and no sooner had he done so than some of the Spotify employees began kicking up saying there should be some editorial oversight of what he's allowed to put out. So far, credit to Spotify, they have said no. 
Spotify said in the past, it's definitely not in the business of deplatforming people. So hopefully that is that. Really, youngsters, if you can't get your head around the idea of working somewhere that enables the spread of a full spectrum of ideas, then don't get a job at one of the companies that does such things. Simple. And then one thing that I don't like. There was a little flurry on climate Twitter this week and a few articles in related blogs and the like as well on the grounds that climate deniers are pointed to Noah. The Trump administration has made a couple of hires. This week it was Ryan Maui who was appointed as NOAA chief scientist. Maui is mostly involved with the weather prediction end of meteorology, but has been sceptical about the attribution of specific extreme weather events to climate change. He supports the IPCC science on climate change, but believes the sensitivity range of CO2 is likely to be on the low side, so he describes himself as a lukewarmer. But as far as some of the activist climate scientists are concerned, there's no distinction to be made. He's a rotten denier. Catherine Hayhoe said this. For the second time this month, a person who misrepresents, distorts and disagrees with climate science is being placed in a science position at NOAA. Now, I looked. I couldn't find anything that supported that description. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but literally what I found was what I used to describe him. Michael Mann, whose Twitter activity is split between climate change and campaigning against President Trump, so very much an activist these days, said this. At a time when we are witnessing the devastating impacts of climate change amplified extreme weather events, including wildfires out west and a record hurricane season here back east, it would have previously seemed unimaginable that an administration would appoint an individual with a record of denying and downplaying these impacts to a position of leadership at the very agency tasked with assessing the risks we face from extreme weather events. And he tweeted the link to the article, Trump appoints pair of climate science deniers to NOAA while climate fueled fires and storms rage. Now, regular viewers will know I dislike the term denier anyway. I don't use it myself. The idea that these scientists use such a label to dismiss out of hand someone who simply doesn't accept the exact same version as yourself, I find that deeply depressing. Now, there are many good climate scientists I see having evidence-based discussions sticking to the research, the quieter majority. Some of them did research I covered in the video I did last week about the US wildfires, which was nuanced and limited in relation to specific influence of climate change. But the higher profile activist scientists are becoming fully bunkered in to a position that's become ideological in a way I think is pretty unhelpful. Now, I don't know if this is a good hire or not. No idea at all about Ryan Maui's qualities for the role that he's been appointed to. But I'm not impressed of this basis that these people are using to dismiss him out of hand as not one of us. All right. Last week's video was demonetized on publication by YouTube, but restored on appeal after about 12 hours, so a faster turnaround than usual. Fortunately, thanks to the good people who support this channel on Patreon, such regular blips are not the end of the world. So this is my shout out to them. Thanks to your support, I can continue to make videos that talk about the important topics, whether or not they will be supported by YouTube advertisers. And I can put some more time into the research heavy videos that a lot of you tend to rank more highly. If you want to add your support to the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content I aim to produce on this channel, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Mm -hmm.